Here's a national registry question for you. You have a patient with a blood pressure of 72 over 48, heart rate of 64, respirations are six times a minute. What type of distributive shock are they most likely in? You're gonna need to know distributive shock if you wanna be able to get through that test. Now we know that shock is the body struggling to get oxygen from the lungs to the tissue. And we know that the cardiovascular system has three basic components, the pump or the heart, blood or volume, and the blood vessels which distribute the blood throughout the body. That's why it's called distributive shock. Now that's just a broad category. There's actually four types of distributive shock, sepsis, neurogenic, anaphylaxis, and psychogenic. We're gonna break all those down and we're gonna go through the primary and secondary assessment as well as the treatments for it. So let's get started. If you take an eight ounce glass of water and pour it into a 16 ounce cup, the containers are only half full or half empty. That depends on you. That's what's going on in distributive shock. The body's blood vessels are dilating and there's not enough blood to actually fill the blood vessels. That's why sometimes it's called relative hypovolemia. You gotta remember, we have a lot of blood vessels in our body. If you took all of your blood vessels out and laid them end to end, you would die. Don't, don't do that. But all four types of shock have that in common, this massive vasodilation. So we're gonna go ahead and start with anaphylaxis. If an allergic reaction is the body being overdramatic, anaphylaxis is it being a complete drama queen. So what's going on is it's identifying some foreign substance as a threat and it starts to clamp down the upper airway, clamp down the bronchioles, and it causes this widespread vasodilation and attempt to allow the white blood cells to get outside of the vascular system. That's what causes a drop in blood pressure and that's why it's categorized as distributive shock. Now, most of these signs and symptoms are gonna present during the primary assessment. And that's a problem because you know that anything that affects the ABCs is potentially life-threatening. So when you assess the airway, you're gonna hear strider from the upper airway swelling. And then when you move on to breathing and you listen to lungs, initially you're gonna hear expiratory wheezing, but as the bronchial constriction continues, you're gonna hear inspiratory and expiratory wheezing. And the skin, unlike hypovolemic shock, is gonna be flush. That's because in hypovolemic shock, the body's shunting blood to the core, but we're in distributive shock where all the blood vessels are dilating, which means the skin has extra blood. So it's not gonna be cool, pale, and diaphoretic. It's actually gonna be flush. So you've worked your way through the primary assessment. You got the patient on oxygen and you're probably starting to develop the field impression of anaphylaxis. Just need to shore up that diagnosis with a secondary assessment. Some real common findings are a rash in the skin or uticaria. And that sense of impending doom that the book talks about, that's a real phenomenon. That's not the patient being overdramatic. That's them reacting to the hormones flowing through their body during an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. The other thing we need to really look at is the history, the sample and the OPQRST. Is the patient allergic to anything? Were they exposed to anything that they were allergic to or were they exposed to a hyperallergenic? All of these things are critical, but once we determine those, we can move on to treatment. Now, we all know that Benadryl and steroids will help allergic reaction patients, but these patients need epinephrine because in anaphylactic shock, we got with this widespread vasodilation, and guess what epi does? It causes widespread vasoconstriction. Anaphylaxis can also cause that bronchial constriction, which epi causes bronchial dilation. So the epinephrine is what's gonna keep this patient alive. Now, if they have a history of allergic reactions, the more severe the allergic reaction, typically the quicker the onset. So before we're thinking Benadryl, we're, we should be thinking epinephrine. The only thing that might come before epinephrine is the oxygen that you administered during your primary assessment. It's a good thing you've stuck around this long because we're about to go over neurogenic shock and that's the one that trips up EMT students. 
It's because most of the time the mechanism of injury that causes neurogenic or spinal shock can also cause hypovolemic shock. So when a student reads that scenario in a test question, they start thinking hypovolemic shock. Now there are a few clues that you're dealing with a neurogenic shock patient rather than a hypovolemic shock patient, but you got to know what to look for. They come out in the primary and secondary assessment, but first let's talk about the pathophysiology of neurogenic shock. Our bodies are constantly adjusting our blood vessels, constricting and dilating. When you stand up, the body needs to increase the pressure to get the vital organs the perfusion it needs. And when you sit down, it doesn't need as much pressure, so they dilate. So we have this constant fluctuation of the blood vessels. Now in neurogenic shock, the spinal cord is cut, so the brain is sending the signals, but the receivers aren't receiving it. So how does this present in the patient? Well, one of the big things is gonna be their skin. So the brain sends a signal, hey, I need more pressure and tells all the blood vessels to constrict. Everything above the injury is receiving that. So there's blood vessel constriction above the injury. And as we know from the hypovolemic shock patient, that means there's no blood going through the skin, so it's cool, pale, and diaphoretic. But what about past the injury? or distal to the injury. So what's going on with that part of the body is you have this widespread vasodilation. So that's gonna be decreasing the pressure, but we're also not shunting blood away from the skin like we are above the injury. So the skin's not gonna be cool, pale, and diaphoretic. Matter of fact, it's gonna be flushed and very warm. The other thing you'll notice on these patients is the heart rate. So you remember from the hypovolemic shock patient video, we determine that cardiac output is determined by heart rate and stroke volume and normally the body will compensate by increasing the heart rate and the brain is sending the signal because it needs more pressure to increase the heart rate but the signal isn't being received so you have these normal heart rates but very low blood pressure because of that vasodilation Neurogenic shock patients don't stay or may never even be in compensated shock. It depends on how quick the injury and the swelling of the spinal cord occurs. <clears throat> so now let's go over the primary assessment of this patient. The airway, obviously you can't open with a head tilt chin lift because we're worried about a spinal injury. So we're going to try a jaw thrust maneuver or maybe an OPA or an NPA to keep that airway open. But if it becomes difficult to manage that airway with a jaw thrust maneuver and you have to choose between C-spine and airway, even on national registry, airway is gonna win. So you may have to do a head tilt chin lift, but it sh certainly shouldn't be your first move. Then as you move on to breathing, you, you may notice slow or absent or even shallow respirations. That's because the brain is sending the signal to the diaphragm to to, to contract, but the diaphragm's not receiving the signal. Again, this depends on where the spinal cord injury is. National Registry fun fact, C3 through five keep you alive. So if you have a spinal cord injury above C5, you may have respiratory signs and symptoms. Now to circulation. We already talked about the skin and that's gonna be the big thing you notice. When you check the patient's pulse, if you can feel it, it's probably gonna be normal. Not super slow, but normal. The skin, however, above the injury is gonna be cool, pale, and diaphoretic as those blood vessels constrict and shunt blood away from the skin. But below the injury, it's gonna be warm and flush. So now let's move over to the secondary assessment. When we get to the secondary assessment, we need to be as detailed as possible because whatever mechanism of injury caused the spinal injury could have caused other injuries. And if you have a patient with any kind of neurological deficits, that can very easily be distracting. So look at the patient over well, make sure we have no internal or external bleeding. Don't stop once you figure out that they have a spinal injury. The other thing that the textbooks don't do a real good job portraying is there's this sense that when a patient gets a spinal injury, just motor and sensory is just gone. But the truth is, a lot of times you'll have a spinal cord injury and the, spine, the spinal cord itself will start to swell. Initially, when you get there, you have no neurological deficits, but as the call transpires, the patient starts to develop tingling and then the numbness and then the loss of sensory or motor, depending on where the spinal cord injury is.
So it's the big thing we need to look at in the secondary is other injuries document the neurological status. The other things we want to look for is a loss of control of the bladder or proprioprism, but I'm sure you've been through that enough in school. So let's move on to treatments. Treatments of the neurogenic shock patient are pretty straightforward. They will tolerate a little bit of fluid replacement if you have that capability and it is in your scope of practice, but laying the patient supine, keeping them warm, not because of the spinal injury, just because of any other internal bleeding that may be going on and rapid transport to a trauma center. Um, these patients, for obvious reasons, we want to transport them on a backboard, seat collar, full spinal precautions, unless it compromises airway, breathing, circulation. I'm going to sum up spinal shock with this. You're not going to see it much on the street, but it's all over the textbook and it's all over national registry. So make sure when you're reading your scenarios, if a patient has a normal heart rate that's not compensating for a low blood pressure, that should be a clue. And if the skin color or condition is different at different levels of the body, that's a really big clue. But most of the time on national registry, you'll have vitals with a low blood pressure and a normal heart rate. Most of the time when you get called out to sepsis, it's gonna be a sick person. Don't let that put your guard down. Septic shock kills more patients than every other type of shock that you're gonna encounter. Now they're not dying in the back of your ambulance, but that doesn't mean they're not dying. So identifying and being able to call in a sepsis alert and get that patient to the right facility is critical. So what's going on in septic shock? Well, the, the, an infection, which normally starts as a UTI or pneumonia, has went system-wide and the body responds by dilating all the blood vessels. Now, obviously that's gonna cause the blood pressure to drop, but they also start to leak. So a lot of times there's a component of non-hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock to it. Since we have that widespread vasodilation, we got the flush skin. The patient's also gonna have a fever. However, it is possible, rare, but possible for the patient to be hypothermic. So what about the primary assessment of the septic shock patient? Well, airways, pretty much the same as any other patient. Generally speaking, we don't have any cervical spine concerns, so a head tilt chin lift or whether, whatever other adjuncts you have available will work just fine. But as we move to breathing, a lot of times, like I said earlier, the patient has a pneumonia component to it. So look for hypoxia, we're gonna place this patient on high flow oxygen. Now, when we move over to the skin, widespread vasodilation, lots of blood in the skin, so we have hot, flush skin. This on top of the fact that the patient has a fever. Now normally registry won't say fever, it'll say hot skin. That's an important word or keyword to remember. Now let's move on to secondary assessment. During the secondary assessment, you're gonna get vitals. Anytime the patient has a fever, they're gonna have a high heart rate. But now we got the vasodilation in the heart trying to compensate with that relative hypovolemia. So we're gonna have these high heart rates. If you put the patient on capnography, they're in metabolic acidosis. So their capnography is gonna be down. If there's a respiratory component, we have to worry about the pulse ox, but more important than that number is the patient's respiratory effort. Most of these patients need to be on oxygen. Calling in a sepsis alert and getting the patient to the right facility is critical. As far as treatment for the septic shock patient, there's not a lot we can do beyond the primary assessment. We're gonna give them oxygen. If you have the capabilities to give them fluid and it's in your scope of practice, you may wanna administer a little bit of fluids, but keep in mind, we're just aiming for submissive hypotension. There's a lot of data out there that shows that trying to bring their blood pressure back to normal may be more harmful than it is helpful. So giving them fluids, drawing bloods, are all beneficial to the patient, but at the end of the day, they need antibiotics and they need this infection under control. So calling your sepsis alert and identifying the right destination is the best thing you can do for treatment. But not least, we're gonna talk about psychogenic shock. I hate that National Registry calls this shock, but it doesn't really matter what I think. It doesn't really matter what you think. But I didn't wanna exclude it from the video because it might pop up on Registry. This is when a strong mental stimuli causes a temporary vasodilation, which drops the blood pressure and leads to a syncopal episode. Your primary assessment and secondary assessment is gonna be treating what you find. There might be some minor injuries with, associated with the syncopal episode, 
A little bit of oxygen to comfort the patient may or may not be applicable. But if National Registry gives you a question like the mother is informed that her child died and what type of shock she's in, now you're going to know it's psychogenic shock. There's no reason for us to really dig into the primary or secondary because it's going to be your typical primary assessment and secondary assessment. Thank you for staying the whole video. Remember that patient at the beginning with the blood pressure of 72 over 48 with the heart rate of 64 and the respirations of six times a minute? Now what type of obstructive shock do you think they're in? Leave it in the comment box and while you're in the comment box, we want to keep making these videos. So let us know what you want us to cover next. Until then, stay safe. The more I read, the more I know, the more I know. The